Good evening and welcome to the Bronx Buzz. Uh, tonight's program is like many of the other ones we did. We're going to be talking to reporters and writers and editors and filmmakers. Uh, that's who we really focus on in this show. And uh, then in our second segment, um, we're going to do more of the same. We're going to start with a reporter and then we'll go to a filmmaker in our second segment. So let's hop right to it and uh, say hello to our buddy uh, Joe Hirsch, who's the editor in chief of the Mott Haven Herald and the Hunts Point Express. Nice to see you, Joe. Nice to have you with us. Hi, Gary. Same here. Hope you've had a good summer. You were just telling me that um, the young people who work on the papers, you're getting a whole new group of them and you'll get started, I guess, just about any day if you haven't already started. 15 new reporters all started wow. a couple of weeks ago and they're on the ground and just about to start running. Uh, all right. Very good. On that note, you are also on the ground and running and you've been running for a little while. I was pleased to notice a section of special projects on the side of the uh, Mott Haven Herald uh, website, and uh, one of them caught my eye, and that was the On the Waterfront project. So, and, and I'm going to give you the first-hand anecdote and then throw it to you. I'm driving down the Major Deegan Expressway, which I have done 40 million times in my life, and in, increase, in an increasing way, I am blown away by the skyline I see in front of me because it is not a skyline from Manhattan. It is a skyline from the Bronx of what appear to be luxury buildings. What is going on on the South Bronx Harlem River waterfront? A massive amount of, of new housing developments, Gary, is what's been going on for the last couple of years, changing the face of the South Bronx and in particular the, the Port Morris side, just south of Mott Haven and facing East Harlem along the um, uh, along the the Harlem River, and so that has been changing the local landscape now for for I would say it, for between the last three and five years. Anybody who went into a coma five years ago and were to return and take a look at our waterfront right now would not recognize it. Would think that they were transported somewhere else. Uh, that is actually true, um, because that's the reaction that I had. I was like, well, wait a minute. Um, are, are many or any of these buildings occupied, thereby already changing the nature of the neighborhoods? Or is it really everything's kind of still under construction? And then at some point, there will be a massive influx of people probably from elsewhere. There is a mix of people living there and projects that are still underway. And so we are, um, one interesting question I think is because there have been so many radical shakeups in the housing market over the last couple of years as a result of the pandemic, that it's going to be interesting to see whether or not all of these newly created apartments along the Port Morris waterfront are in fact going to meet the developer's pre preliminary expectations for being able to fill them and get market rates for these places. This this is one of one of numerous questions. My first question is for the people who have I mean, I'll just make the assumption, move from elsewhere to live in these very interesting, culturally rich neighborhoods. Uh, is there a mix or is there a resentment or are we still trying to figure out how people are going to coexist or adapt or I'd hate to think not adapt to what's already there? I would say it's the latter. I think that there are there is an awful lot of resentment and nervousness on the part of people who live in the neighborhood who feel that they are, who rightly feel that they are unable to afford the rents being charged for these new waterfront developments. And at the same time, the ripple effect is causing rents to rise across the neighborhoods, uh, the, the rest of the South Bronx. Not only uh, are, the, are the prices, are the rents really high on the waterfront, but that means that rents have risen across the area. And so... That is creating resentment, and many of the people, many longtime residents, are worried and um, and suspicious that many of the new businesses that are coming in, such as at the tail end of Alexander Avenue toward the waterfront, are not built for them, but rather for newcomers. And it would uh, price them out, et cetera. Um, is there a sense of displacement right now? I mean, the, the number um, you quoted there, and, and just think of this number, we need housing. I'm not sure we need this kind of housing. 4,900 plus apartment units being developed on the waterfront. That's a lot of apartments and that's thousands of people. 
Um, uh, uh, are people already being displaced, do you sense? Or it's going to happen because this is the tidal wave that's coming to the Bronx? I get more of a tidal wave sense. I, I think that I, I think that there are there are fears of displacement that that are um, the, more than actual big numbers. Mm -hmm. the, I, and I remember, you know, the whole dialogue, my goodness, when the, um, all, all that stuff was um, being created um, and then became the Richfield properties and everything else. My goodness, we've been through a lot. Um, there was talk of making the waterfronts public so that, you know, everybody could enjoy the waterfront. Now, I'm not I'm not making the trade that you should lose your housing and get a nice waterfront. I'm not I'm not suggesting that, but I'm getting, you know, are we finally going to look because I know there's always been talk because we have a waterfront there and it's, you know, it's been train tracks. Um, is there a sense that maybe there will be some improvements that will um, support um, local traditional Bronx sites, or really, let's face it, it's going to be for the people who move in from somewhere else. I think we're in. These are. It, it's. It remains a mystery, Gary. Nobody uh -huh. really knows at this point, and I think uh -huh. that there are many that that the questions are up in the air. This is all too new. There are there are a fair number of people locally who say let them in. This is going to make the, the neighborhood more mixed and interesting. There are going to be more shops and there is going to be, and there is going to be some vibrancy. Um, and so that's the flip side of the other side of the coin of people who are worried and suspicious that the neighborhood is going to change and become increasingly unaffordable for them. So, um, so as to the ideas about what the, the fate of the waterfront, who knows as, um, so now Rafael Salamanca, uh, ironically, the council member down there, um, has a whole section. Um, I, I thought very brilliantly put through the city council a little while back a, a requirement that anytime there's rezoning or development that um, uh, the, the um, characteristics of the neighborhood be properly evaluated so that we can understand what is the effect of it. My sense for a lot of this development it slipped in before that requirement happened, which is how this kind of runaway freight train happened before somebody could get their hooks on it. Am I, is, is my chronology correct here? Well, well, I think that one of the things that we found, in fact, in putting together that series that you just mentioned on right. the waterfront last year is that the... the most of the housing happening along the waterfront with views of Manhattan across the Harlem River are market rate with very little so-called affordable housing whereby people would be able to rely on area median income to keep the rates relatively affordable. Whereas as you go farther inland and away from the waterfront, that's where you find the affordable housing along the lines of what your uh, I, I, the councilman had been um, vying for. You know, it's uh, ironic that you say that. We're recording this on a Monday. I believe on Tuesday, there's a very big uh, affordable housing thing that's going to open up uh, like 149th Street or somewhere down there. Um, uh, so now we're back to um, kind of your original point and your original speculation, which I thought was fascinating, um, we make the assumption that people are going to come in droves and fill up these apartments at market rates. Um, I don't know. What do you? What, what do we think? You know, it's like you put up a for sale sign. You're going to make any sales? And and will people? Oh, listen, it's transportation rich. You can get downtown very quickly. As as pricey as it might be, it's going to be less expensive than opening, doing the same thing on Second Avenue, you know, in Upper Manhattan or somewhere like that. Um, what do you think? Are people going to come here and say, "Wow, I'd love to come down to the boogie down and spend my life and invest here"? It's a fascinating question, <laughs> Gary, and I don't know the answer because oh, okay. there's so many factors tossed in. Yeah, yeah. So yes, it's going to be unaffordable for people in the in many people living in the neighborhood. Right. It's going to be very likely 
more affordable for people coming in from Manhattan. Right. And so the the prices are going to not, they are at least at the beginning, they're not going to be Manhattan level rents. And so that is that that's the that that is that's the presumed the, draw. Yeah. And yet at the same time, there are questions are people you just talked about your 40 million drives along the hideous major. Deep. <laughs> well, you know, how, how many people coming in from Manhattan are going to want to walk under the Deegan every day to get to and from the 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 six train right uh, and and if they if they do it and the developers believe there's still a market for it then you're going to see more changes i want to add one more thing and then we're almost out of time but i got to ask you about that um port morris waterfront uh park um i remember somewhere that one of the big hotels maybe four seasons bought a property on south on park avenue south park avenue is that still alive like do they have that with, with the idea that this was going to be a new a new place I believe that the the Opera House, right? Is that the one we're talking? No, 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 no. That's that's much more further interior. All right, let's not oh, go there. I think but, I think the one you're referring to is still there. I've seen it. Still there. All right. Uh, anyway, let's talk about um, the, the. This is what I think is good news. They're going to talk about the waterfront. There could be a waterfront park uh, over there at Port Morris. So let's just talk about that. Okay. So um, the uh, a, a city nonprofit called the Waterfront Alliance is helping to to try to raise the the city's interest level in investing in some of these in in informally stewarded waterfront not really parks but water locations along waterfronts across the city and apparently according to the waterfront alliance there are more than a thousand of these believe it or not wow. Morris happens to be one of them and it was one of four that were featured in a meeting that happened a couple of weeks ago. And all of this, this entire new momentum is based on a comprehensive plan, a waterfront comprehensive plan released by the city last year, mm -hmm. trying to help sit, uh, neighborhoods such as the South Bronx, where pe the people who live in the neighborhood have so, where there is no, there are no access points to their right. waterfront. And this is something, listen, this is something that's been talked about. South Bronx Unite has been all over this for generations, <laughs> if you will. Um, which, you know, just taking a step back from the conversation we've had. So look at what you've got. Here's some maybe investment for the local community. Of course, ironically, coming at a time when there's new development coming. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of a... A, a tug of war, I suppose. Anyway, Joe, um, we, we're going to keep reading um, the Mott Haven Herald and the Hunts Point Express and all the great new young people that you are training and tutoring. And um, we're going to ask them to come on the Bronx Buzz. And I can guarantee you we're going to ask you to come back because we're going to answer some of these questions as they unfold in front of us. And I just have one one last note, Gary. We're at the 10-year anniversary of Sandy, which came within a few hours of flooding the country's biggest food distribution market, the Hunts Point Food Distribution Market. And there was and and there was a hue and cry at the time, almost 10 years ago to the day, about the about the city's need to invest in in trying to and has it been done off the shoreline? <laughs> Not been done. Um, Joe Hirsch, he tells the future. He's got his crystal ball with a little science, never hurt, uh, and a little sense of history. Always great, Joe. Um, Next time, Gary, we'll talk about what hasn't been done. Or, or, or maybe what has been done. We'll see. Uh -huh. uh, uh, be well. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we're going to take a short break, um, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'm thrilled because, and, and I know Joe knows them, the uh, Bronx Filmmakers Collective is having the 10th anniversary. We will pop some champagne and celebrate. Don't go away.
All right, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. I am so happy because one of my uh, longtime friends and colleagues in the Bronx is um, is celebrating an anniversary, and we all want to. I, I, I should have brought champagne and popped the cork, but uh, nonetheless, Hannah uh, Lee Shaw, who is the co-founder of the Bronx Filmmakers Collective, congrats to you and the collective. Ten, yes, ten years. Hannah. Yes, yeah, yes, thank good. you so much for um, having me. Let's, let's um, get back to the beginning. Um, well, I would say, when did it start? I'm guessing it was 2012. Uh, and um, uh, what was the dream and uh, where are we at in fulfilling that dream? So we started 10 years ago. Uh, we were born out of the Bronx Documentary Center. Um, Mike Camber, who is the director there, was great and provided us with a free space to meet. Um, and we've sort of grown organically over the ten, last 10 years and sort of tried to figure out what our group should look like and we've made some changes to it and um, right now we are a good core group of filmmakers who live in and around the Bronx who are active in independent narrative film and documentary film and we meet to support each other and to provide education to each other. Uh, how much of a hard sell was it when you got started? Like um, my, my sense is once you put up the shingle and said, this is Bronx Filmmakers Collective, that um, knowing people of the Bronx, they came out of the woodwork and they said, well, of course, I've always wanted to, I'm gonna do this, These are, this is the society I wanna be part of. Or was it like, well, we gotta keep putting the stuff out, we gotta find people, et cetera, et cetera. What was- what, You know, what it's was a little it? bit of both. We did get a very strong reaction at first, but there were a lot of people who hadn't actually made any films yet who were aspiring. And we sort of had to figure out how to work as a group with that kind of mix of experienced filmmakers and brand new people. Um, and so we've, we've, we have struggled a bit getting the more experienced filmmakers to oh. stick around. Um, unfortunately, the Bronx still has a bit of a reputation of the kind of places when you make it, you leave. Um, and we're hoping that filmmakers that make it stick around and stay part of our group. Do, do you have a sense, and, and I'm guessing, and I probably have interviewed some of them along the way, that filmmakers who might, or people who might have been interested in film, yeah, they kind of, well, that would be interesting, but they got inspired because they were part of a group because they had contacts with other people who had equipment and technology and they could find a director and they knew where to begin to look for actors, that, that their, their careers and their craft improved as, a, a, frankly, a direct result of uh, the Bronx Filmmakers Collective? Yes, I, I think that's true. I think we've taught a number of like beginner film classes, screenwriting and intro to film at... Um, at BronxNet, actually, at uh, through BCA, Bronx Council on the Arts, um, and we have found new people that way and brought them in, and then watched them grow into more experienced filmmakers, which is very exciting. And Definitely. and then um, you you run a um, uh, like like a festival or something, and and then what? Let's just say, okay, Gary finally got his film together, um, be, you know, belonged to the Filmmakers Collective, used some of the resources, some of the contacts. And now I've got, I don't know, a 12 minute film about something of interest. Um, th then, then what happens? Do you help them get it out? Can you provide that? Um, do they work with colleagues? Um, yes. Where, where, do, where, do, where do they go? Where, where, do, where does Gary go at that point? Well, you, you generally our films, when our filmmakers finish them, go on the festival circuit. And so our group is helpful in terms of getting suggestions about which festivals are worthwhile because mm -hmm. each of these things costs money and sort of figuring out a marketing plan. We as a group don't actually do the marketing, but we support the individual filmmakers who do. We also do coordinate and, and organize community screenings. So at different places around the borough, we've done some at the Bronx Museum, at Bronx Art Space, at Community Gardens, different locations where we screen our members work to expose uh, our members to the community, but also to bring independent film to the Bronx. Because as you know, we've got only two theaters in this whole borough and they, sit, they only show commercial stuff, no independent film. So this is that's not- a, That's a mistake. I'm sorry. That's a mistake. That we can't, that, 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 you know what? You're right. We shouldn't, you mean it's a mistake we shouldn't allow it? I agree. No, no, no. It's a mistake that that's what it is. That, that can't, pot, that's ridiculous. Because 161st you, you could, Street and Co op City, those yeah. are the only two remaining theaters in the Bronx. And they show, like, you know, very mainstream commercial. Yes, of course. Well, and, and there's, there's value to that. And of course, somebody's making money on that. But if you've got a multi theater, one of those theaters once a week, right? could say, hey, we're going to work with Hannah 
And we're going to, and listen, that's the other thing I want to talk about. There are uh, other film groups. I mean, there's the people that send people out to do films in 48 hours. Um, there's, you know, all kinds of um, different film groups. Um, seems to me, get everybody together, you know. And, and, yeah, that's and, a great my, idea. We do work, Bronx 48, BX 48, which is the right. film race you were just talking about. We do work with them. Our members have been judges for them, and they're very supportive of us as well. I, you know, I'm, I have to tell you, I am still blown away. You know, I always say that I, if, it's, if it's a good show, if I learn something, I never put my arms around the fact that we only have two theaters left. And think of the richness. I, I, I remember as growing up as a kid and you'd look at the list of theaters in every neighborhood. Right. My goodness. Yeah. Um, have the nature of the films changed in the 10 years? In other words, you were getting a certain kind of film then. I'm guessing the technology is better so people... Um, can can shoot film and do stuff a little better now. They can probably edit more easily in their homes as opposed to finding an editor or something like that. Or am I totally wrong? And it's really the same content as it was. 10 well, years. I think I think there has been some some improvement in terms of the quality of the work, and I think that's a combination of our education and our exposure to each other as our skills grow. Um, and some of it is just cheaper access to materials. But I think the, um, the interesting thing about the work that's being created is that each artist really has their own individual vision. And we do see that repeated in all of their work. There, it, there's really a tone to people's work. So what's interesting to watch is that the tone stays the same, but the quality improves. And that's a fascinating trajectory over the last 10 years. Wow. That is, that is amazing. Do you have, um, and by the way, um, and we're going to, we're going to promote it in a moment. Um, there is a 10th anniversary celebration. Which there is. We're, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, do you have some favorite films or favorite types of films that have, I, I know you don't want to single anybody out. I, I, we all get that, but, but what, what um, came across your desk, so to speak, and had you say, wow, this is what we have created the Filmmakers Collective for. You know, I I would say that there isn't one film. I mean, I, I know that Somehow sort of I knew you were going to do that to me. I think what, what it really is about watching the individual artists grow, because that's the sort of basis of our group. We really wanted to be a work group where each individual filmmaker could improve their craft. And so to watch someone grow as an artist and and that's what's satisfying it's not so much the individual film we are a relatively small group right now we're less mm -hmm. than 20 people we really do hope to expand so if you're a filmmaker out there yes. please check out our website because there's an application on there we have minimal requirements to join um because we want to be as inclusive as possible but um we're always looking for new people uh but i'm gonna um, expand that a little bit so i have really good ideas Maybe I have a camera. Maybe I've shot a little bit. I've done. I've done a little bit of editing, but in order, and I'd like to make a film, but I need to find a director. I got to find actors, somebody who may know a little more about lighting than I do. All those resources are in there in all the people because they're all working on the same thing. So you can share stuff, right? Am, am I going there? So yes, I'm, yes, I'm punching we, it. That is what we do. We 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 have weekly. I'm sorry. We have monthly sessions where we meet and give each other feedback on work and have right. training and education sessions. But we have a, a an email group where we are constantly exchanging information, sharing resources, asking for help in different areas. So it's a it is a, a community that supports you whenever you need it. Uh, okay. So the big party. Oh, yeah, I got it right here. It's uh, on September twenty second, right? Four forty eight East one forty ninth Street. Correct. Um, well, what? What? Um, just remind me which building is that? That is one of the spaces that Destination Tomorrow, the Bronx. Oh, 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 great, 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 great. Um, they were kind enough to let us have their party, our party there. And so uh, free tickets are available on our website. Registration is required. So please do go to the website to register for a ticket. So and that would be, frankly, a, a aside from wanting to go and celebrate a very important Bronx organization, that would be um, a really good place for the aforementioned filmmaker that we just talked about hypothetical filmmaker that we just talked about to just go and be there and get a sense, meet Hannah. Hannah will introduce you to everybody around. And I know I've been to some of the showings at the Bronx documentary center and the vibe is just 
excellent. It's just people happy to meet you, et cetera, et cetera. I believe the last time I went was before the pandemic and we were still allowed to shake hands and hug people. And yes. so that, there was a lot of that going on. I do, I do specifically recall that. Um, yeah. Just to kind of wrap this up, um, what would you ultimately like to see? Like, like when you come back here in, in five years or for your 11th or for your, I don't know, what, what would you say as, you know, as kind of the, the co-founder of this organization, what would you say would, would be a really cool thing to have happen? I mean, well, we did an just Oscar our, award. I mean, I don't. Know. We just got our first space. We are now officially. Oh yes, yes, yes. Talk about that. In a space, so we we are part of a, an artist collective space that BX Arts Factory opened on 153rd Street. Yes, yes. So we okay. have one of the studios in there. There are other organizations like Bronx Bound Books that has a studio. There's other writers and uh, fashion designers. It's a fantastic space. And then there are these public shared rooms where we can hold screenings and teach classes and things like that. I got to get down there. Maybe do I'll you? go down there and you'll, Definitely you'll meet do. me down there. So we're hopeful that yes. this new space will sort of begin us on a new chapter of having a different kind of public engagement because up until now, we've had to ask for favors from people. Can we do something here? Can we do something there? Now we mm -hmm. just have our own space where we can host events and activities. And so we really are hopeful that that is going to open the door for some things. It also is a great place for our members to hold auditions and rehearsals. All of the other above. kinds of production meetings. So we're really looking forward to supporting our members with this. I am a very big believer in having sat in his seat for many years. Um, that we are so fragmented and so disjointed because of so many of the things that we have to overcome to get where we want to be, that when you put this kind of space together, there could be a relationship between Bronx Bound Books and a filmmaker or all the other creative people working in the same space. I really got to get down there. I'm going to, we're going to talk more about that. Yes. So you got that space um, and, and um, you're going to do the um, anniversary party. Um, Anderson, let's just roll that up there again. So it's Thursday, the 22nd uh, at um, uh, 7 to 10 PM, 448 East 149th street on the third floor. Hannah, you're just doing great work and, you and so we just want Thank you to keep doing me. it. Um, because th th that's who we are in the Bronx. And if we're going to, that's all that other stuff. This is who we are. We got to be who we are. Um, and so that will do it for uh, the Bronx Buzz. We thank our buddy Joe Hirsch from uh, the Mott Haven Herald and uh, the Hunts Point Express for joining us earlier. Next week, fascinating show. It just turned out by coincidence. Both segments are going to be about food insecurity from different angles. And we're going to have an, uh, a Grammy Award winning folk singer on the program as well. So that's the Bronx Buzz. We'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>